for the last decade at least, I have been living in and working in very deep retirement. <laughs> Once in a while, I am made to come to the surface to show myself and hopefully uh, take breaths of fresh air, and I hope that this will happen today. I thank Dwayne for this invitation, which I accepted without a clear idea of what I could contribute to this meeting. I had nothing ready in my drawer. Eventually, I came up with three reflections, and the first of which, or the first one, in, or in the first one, I tried to put it simply, I tried to figure out why I was invited in the first place. <laughs> then I'll go back to questions of temporality I encountered in my own ethnographic work with objects, and finally, I have some musings about the apparent omnipresence or conceptual inflation of curator and curating. So the first, uh, first part, what am I doing here? <clears throat> the first, I have several answers to this, but the first one I have may sound facetious, but I think it is realistic. I am here as an exhibit. <laughs> and as an exhibit, uh, I am here as an exhibit as the author of Time and the Other, a book first published more than 30 years ago, which seems to have become an obligatory reference in debates among museum curators. What do you expect from me other than what I said in the book? <laughs> or if there is some truth in what I said about me being an exhibit, have I now become an object of curating? Which leads to, a more, to more questions. Is it possible to spell out the precise reasons for the popularity of that book? what is being cited and what is being quoted, which is not the same. Uh, and this is, has been something that troubled me ever since the book was out. It was cited and seldom quoted. Uh, do those who cite it and quote, quote time and the other, do this in a way that respects the origin and the basic intentions and purposes of the book, namely an anthropologist's critical reflection on contradictions, contradictions between empirical research practices and the theoretical discourse pronounced, written and taught after returning from the field. The research practices requiring shared time and the discourse denying shared time to those whom we researched. Could it be that curators are mining the book for quotations in support of answers to their problems, not mine? To find answers, I recalled three occasions that made me aware of a time and the other having entered the world of curating. I will try to be as quick as I can about it. The first one, <clears throat> not the very first one, the first one I want to talk about here is when Laurent Olivier, a French archaeologist, sent me his book, uh, Le, Profond, Le Profond Abîme de Time, de, 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 du Temps, uh, a book in which he revised the history of French archaeology. And then comes uh, more and more to, uh, and, and builds this up in, in ways that I cannot summarize quickly here, is that we finally, as archaeologists, yeah, we have to realize that we are not studying the past. We're certainly not studying in the past. We're studying the present. Archaeology is the study of the present. And then you have to specify what kind of present, and that gets him into one of his most remarkable concepts I find, uh, which is uh, 
material mo memory. I just signaled this. Another occasion came when uh, a curator at large, as they are now uh, busy everywhere, Anselm Franke, came to interview me for the journal Manifesta. I, I was sitting there in my little town. What, what, why would, does he come to me? I mean, what is, all right, it was time and the other again. And um, the, the, this piece was published in the title, The Architecture of Anthropological Time. <clears throat> I never used the term architecture in our talk, and I avoid it because uh, uh, th that's the first wrong step that you take when you spatialize, spatialize time by calling by, by talking about an architecture. I was, I've been guilty of that too, but I don't want to repeat it now. And, uh, but it, it was interesting because he made me spell out how I got to the book, what, the, what were the, its roots, as I always claim, in my field, field work problems, etc. And then a third example uh, is an, uh, an article by another independent curator, Maria Inigo Clavo. Is she here? Could be. Uh, it's titled "Statues Even." Uh, sorry, "Statues Die: Time and Agency of Museum Display." It, it appeared in the inaugural issue of a journal called Stadelike Studies, which I assume is the is the museum of or the journal of the Amsterdam Municipal Museum. Klava also addresses issues which the conveners of this movement of this meeting here on museum temporalities named in. Uh, their call for contributions. It was, I was above all impressed by her taking as a point of departure for arguments on time and agency a film, Les Statures Meurent Aussi, Statues All Will Also Die, a film I had never seen, uh, it, uh, although it came out, uh, uh, it was made by Chris Marker and uh, Alain René in 1953. You may know it, but I, I, I'd never seen it before. For 1953, it was a remarkable critique of the Western gaze on African objects. And it still is, I think. Clavo summarizes, and that's why I said it, Clavo summarizes the message of this movie, or this documentary, as showing Quote, that the African masks of the museum have been both deteriorized, de deterritorialized from their places and functions and detemporalized of their history, as well as of our own. And then she goes on to elaborate on this message by citing and then now quoting time and the other, and I agree with her, no surprise, uh, when throughout the essay she puts the focus on agency in a political sense of the word, in, in terms of political. You know, the, the, the original title for time and the other was to be the politics of, the politics of time in anthropology. That was the, was supposed to be the, and it was then by the editors they found it too heavy, it was, was made, Luckily, it was made into time and the other. And, uh, uh, okay, now, I hope that neither telling you this last anecdote, oh, there was an anecdote I want to tell because <laughs> uh, with this t working title, The Politics of Time, it went by five editors of pi five uh, uh, publishers and wasn't accepted uh, until uh, finally Edward Said recommended it at Columbia University Press. 
Now, what I want to say is, don't take this just as sort of uh, some self-indulgent, uh, self-advertising talk here. Uh, take them, take these remarks as my way of putting up for debate issues that I think are central when we discuss museum temporalities. Time and materiality and the materiality of objects, time and ethnographic practice, and the political significance and implications of curating. Time and working with objects. What are my qualifications for talking here? I never worked in a museum. Though my first exposure to anthropology was when I studied Völkerkunde and Ethnology in, back in Germany and Austria, uh, which had emerged from the museum, I was made to forget them when I got my professional training at the, in the 60s at the University of Chicago. The then canonical four fields of human evolution, prehistory, linguistics, and the study of uh, uh, the uh, society and cultural systems uh, where in, in this four fields, material culture did not exist. And as far as I know, you may correct me, 63, museology was not yet invented as, a, as an academic discipline. Uh, and and I, want to, I want to stress that this was not uh, forgetting it simply, it was banning it. You would come up with a PhD proposal, sorry, on material culture, they would laugh you out of the department. That, that, you know, those were, no, that was something for the Field Museum. Anyway, it was also heavily gender-coded, right? Uh, it was something for women. It, that's, that's how it was, the situation then. All right. Now, then I got trained as I was in Chicago. I went to the field and did my first field work on a, on a, religious, a religious movement. And the members that, of this movement that I, uh, whom I encountered <coughs> wore no distinctive dress and used no special paraphernalia. My attention was riveted on listening to them and documenting words they spoke when they met for prayers and instruction and so forth. Taking ethnographic notice of objects, actual things, came much later, almost a decade later, when I went back to the Congo with another research, uh, research project, this time on uh, language and work, uh, uh, centered on Swahili and, and industrial labor. And I was confronted all of a sudden with most, in the most obvious way, uh, uh, man, uh, uh, what, what do you call it, furniture, uh, new African furniture, which I've met in this one workshop where I did part of my fieldwork. And then with paintings on the walls, displayed on the walls of living rooms of peoples, in shops, and entertainments. And this was an overwhelming experience. And now, for reasons that I cannot go into here, uh, or uh, I, I can go into it, I don't have the time. In Europe alone, about 15,000 of those paintings painted by the people for the people have wound up in museums. 15,000, very few as exhibits, most of them in storage, physically and virtually. To that virtually, I'll come back later. Now it's time to ask, ask where is time in all of this? 
An almost immediate and direct answer came with the discovery of what held this bewildering variety of objects, paintings together. What made it a corpus, as it were, in the minds of their creators, their painters, and the people who bought them? And that was, there was even a word for it. And there was the Swahili word, ukumbusho, which is an abstract uh, uh, noun formed from a verb which means to make remember, reminder. So this wasn't art. This was Ukumbushu. Paintings came in many labeled genres, which together repre represented a regime or a repertoire of shared memories. Here we are with memory. Reaching from times and ancestral through events of colonial and post-colonial history to the present. The most important insight Again, I've written about this. If it interests you, you can read, etc. But the most important insight gained was that through these objects, people were remembering the present. As I put it in the title of a book. You know, we all, it's a paradoxical formula for us. We remember the past, we live in the present. In this case, it was clear that this body of objects was a means to uh, call up the present, by remembering the present. Then later, theoretically, this led me to explore the interplay between remembering and recognition. Uh, and between presentation and representation. And uh, I, uh, I, uh, wrote, oh, I have a problem with this here. I uh, wrote a number of essays to just give you the title, Remembering the Other, Knowledge and Recognition in the Exploitation of Central Africa. That was sort of a, uh, one and the other one was on recognizing things the ethnic artifact versus the ethnographic objects there's another distinction a very important one but also that element of one remember one recognizes it and the mode of recognizing is also remembering i would now say that uh, one way to bring museum temporality into focus is to understand that objects which, while they are being there, while they are being there in walls, in vitrines, in depots, is a fact, their being present or co-present with us is not given, but must be created and maintained. Of course, this is not a novel insight. Was it not achieved, for instance, my favorite example, in the Tropen Museum 30 years ago, with their Indian market? Remember the Indian market in the Tropen Museum? Terrific. It was complete with recorded noises, the market buzzle, the smell of the spices that were, were, were exhibited, the aroma of the spices, and I remember the smell of the cow dung in the pavement of one of the, the huts. And of course, you could see all those things only by moving through it. So there was movement, smells, sounds, movements. Hmm? I may be wrong, but I sense, uh, uh, no, uh, 
I'm sorry, a little lost here. Okay. Was this not a successful way to make objects present? I think the answer is no. Being, having it as a permanent ex exposition, the museum could not but dramatize, dramatize the absence of a real Indian market. And it dramatized this by its very efforts to create a realistic, a realistic presentation. To me, this means when we debate museum temporalities, we question not only practices of curating, but the museum as such. You question the trouble of curating, you question the museum as an institution even if we don't put that question into words and have to go on working in museums. Uh, before I come to the curators, I, uh, 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 let me insert a critical remark on the phenomenon that I have, have observed recently. Uh, you know, being in this position to to, to look at anthropology and museology from the sidelines uh, at, at the discourses, what I see is a kind of conceptual disease that is spreading. Let's call it the creepy plural. Its symptoms, so to speak, are when we, is, uh, its symptoms are exemplified, for instance, when we speak of temporalities rather than temporality. But it, it gets worse. There is talk about ontologies rather than ontology. And then it gets still worse when they talk about knowledges in the plural, right? And of course, memories, etc. That's a big epistemological question in my mind that, we, that I will, can just signal to you. I don't think we will ever even have time to discuss. Of course, I'm aware of the fact that this is has come in the wake of another pluralization, one of which we once were very proud in anthropology, namely, not culture, but cultures, was celebrated as the big step towards modern anthropology in histories of anthropology. And we sell, as I said, we celebrated this as a theoretical achievement until it came back to haunt us as cultural relativism. I re uh, instead, for what it is worth uh, I, uh, of discussing, rather than discussing this here, I will give you, do, do I have, where am I time-wise? Five minutes? Yeah, approximately, yes. <laughs> I, I'll give you, I'll give you uh, two thoughts, two thoughts that I lift from myself. That's also a symptom of age. Um, from my, my, my notebook, the, and, and I put them there in, uh, in there last year. Here, quote, I pondered the difference between ta different, the difference between difference and alterity. In an obvious way, the two are key concepts, one in a taxonomic way of thinking and the other one in a dialectical way of thinking. But the verses 
easily hides the sliding from logic into ideology when difference is used to pacify, domesticate alterity. By making alterity just a rhetorical embellishment of more prosaic difference. Or by embracing alterity with the long arms of relativism. Another example is, now I'll come back again, of pacif what I would call pacification is pluralization. This may be dismissed as trivial, what with all the talk about pluralism, but it remains irritating when it comes up with grammatical usages such as knowledges. Even if it is just a calc on culture cultures, it calls for critique. And what if putting knowledge in the plural, and that's the, the, the real question, but I must leave you in the air with it. What if putting uh, knowledge and other con such concepts in the plural results in annihilating the very concept? What if putting plural, plurality or plurality in the plural makes it impossible for us, uh, for us? Uh, what if putting temporality in the plural makes it impossible for us to think about temporality? So now I'm almost done. Uh, Curating in objects. Earlier I said that presence, the presence of objects, is perhaps the most important issue when we consider temporality in the museum and that their being present and co-present with us is not given but must be created and maintained. Creating and maintaining presence should therefore be the core task of curators. <laughs> especially in a situation where the term concept or concept of curator has spread out of the museum. Curator is curiously not part of my word spelling th thesaurus. No synonym. But as an entry in Google, it gives 36 million hits. Curator as ethnographer still gives 180 or 168 hits. And, and so on and so on. You see, also, you see what I mean? It spreads. Uh, in fact, however, I was recently reminded that I myself have been a curator for quite a while. I'll tell you why. Uh, and, 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 and that happened when, together with uh, my friend and colleague Vincent de Roy, I set up a virtual archive of ethnographic text some 10, 15 years ago. An archive. And now I have this paper from last year, or the year before, called Curating the Ethnographic Moment by one Andrew Asher and one Lori Janke, whom I don't know. It appeared in Archive Journal in, 19, uh, in 2013. As an example for what they're discussing, they, uh, uh, they quote, they refer to what, uh, an experiment of mine, which I called writing from the, writing from the virtual archive. And I claimed in this little book that this, that, that this would lead, would be accommodated in a new genre of writing, which I called commentary. So the book is ethnography as commentary, writing from the virtual archive. Commentary ref here refers to a kind of writing and reading that can be done in the co-presence, virtual 
but material. Virtual presence is not immaterial. In the, in the co-presence of virtual but material, of objects that we call texts or documents. You will see presently why this is relevant to this meeting. I sense, namely, that the ethnographic praxis or practice that I've been reporting on, keeping an archive and working on the with and curating museum objects, that there is a convergence. Especially now that museums have become to digitize their holdings and have wound up with huge, huge digital, digital archives of their collections and also of their documentation. So I suggest thinking about museum temporalities has a few new challenges. I stop here.